Hello everyone, you are watching Edis English Literature. I am Ardhendu De. Today, in this video lecture, I am going to read John Dunn's metaphysical poem, The Good Morrow, and discuss the core theme of love, love's depth and devotion, and its triumph over all earthly mutability and mortality. John Dunn's The Good Morrow is a characteristic metaphysical poem which deals with the theme of love, a strong and true passion of love in fact. After the soul's awakening of the lover and the beloved in this poem are consumed with the passion of love and they become one, the unified whole. In fact, this oneness in love triumphs over all earthly mutability and mortality and signs over in mutual attachment, a love which does not deal with the body but in the bond between and the souls and the lovers. The concentration of thought and compression of style of this particular poem marks it as a metaphysical poem. The metaphysical concepts that we are finding out in this particular poem are drawn from geography, mythology and scholastic and philosophical sources. But notably here is the intellectual approach to the entire theme or presentation of the subject of love. The subject of love is nothing new in this type of poetry as there has been parallel Shakespearean sonnets and the type of Elizabethan writing. But the treatment of the theme is unique one, that's why the particular term metaphysical has been given. It was Samuel Johnson who first christened John Donne and his school of poetry a metaphysical sort in uh, the particular writing Life of Cowley. About the beginning of the 17th century appeared a race, appeared a race of writers. Uh, that may be termed the metaphysical poets. Johnson derived the term from Dryden's disparaging remark that Dan affects the metaphysics. So it's a negative term he has used that too much affectations of the uh, intellectual or as well as imagery or the intricacies of thoughts and expressions are there. So in current literary criticism that as we are reading what is metaphysical, it underlines the very special features of dance poetry, the lively play of intellect, and the alliance of passions, the playfulness, the reorganization of many-sidedness of human passion, complex and dramatic as well as in syntax patterns, there is so much complexity and so much innovativeness. Uh, there is uh, the poetic practice in particularly that Dan started and uh, this type of writing of the poetry uh, that powerful movement it started um, which uh, a kind of unfenced a large body of poetry in the first half of the uh, 17th century and brought about a revival a kind of a, a revival of thought content or complexity and the same poetic traditions of metaphysical in modern time has been revived by, as you all know, um, T.S. Eliot. So the central figures of uh, John Donne, Herbert, Henry Vaughan, Andrew Marvel, and uh, Richard Crasson. So these are the central figures in modern times, T.S. Eliot. These are the metaphysical torch bearers and uh, we are heading to John Dunn's particular this poem. Uh, we can find out many of the metaphysical features in this poem. So we will minutely observe this particular poem, read this particular poem. When we are reading this particular poem, The Good Morrow, the title comes to our mind first. What is Good Morrow? The greetings you all know. Uh, here the morning greetings is making the only exception is there the lover is greeting to his beloved and these morning greetings is not for the physical entity but for the souls and they have awakened from the uh, reality of love it means the the true realization of the love they have come to it has a defining significance as it refers to the awakenings of the soul of the lovers after a long slumber and their meetings and fallings in love with each other 
is like that of a new understanding to this plethora of love, to this new gamut of love. And one thing never get confused with the Don and his and more uh, to that of the lover and his beloved in this poem. But I am telling that uh, in this poem we will find out a lover is talking to his beloved. But here you cannot parallel the lover with that of Don and uh, the beloved with that of Anne, his wife. Even though Don had 12 children with Anne, here is no such amorous union but philosophical and platonic union. Now let's start reading this poem. Before you start reading this poem, I, I, I like to tell you one thing. Uh, here are three stanzas, seven lines each. Each stanza has the accent in all first four lines. In the last three lines, he thinks about what he has just said. So here the last three lines is the explanatory one. Here are many grammatical inversions. So while we are reading, just try to get those inversions and get the message clearly. The poem begins with a listed questionnaire. I wonder by my truth what thou and I did till we laughed. Were you not went till then? but sucked on country pleasures childishly or snorted we in the seven slippers den so the initial four lines makes a lot of questions the questions are made by the lover to his comrade beloved the inquisitive lover suggests that both he and his beloved had been detached by their old habits of going on fanciful thinking, fanciful imagination as well as the dream of love. Before they actually loved each other in its true sense. So earlier whatever the love affair they had had been the love like that of a childish one. But presently, as they have understood what the true love is, they are bidding good morning to the new awakening. It is the typical awakening or good morning of the lover who has just realized what true love is. The spirits of the lover and his lady love are fully awakened, fully awakened from the earliest state of being. Now they have awakened to the true passion of love. Hence the awakened soul of the true lover greet each other on their first meeting. Hello, good morning. The lover wants to mean here impliedly through this mood of question that before he and his beloved actually met and loved each other, they passed their pre-love period. You know, even though they were in love, but they were not in true spiritual love, true understanding of love. So this pre-love condition, I say, pre-love period by getting delayed from the natural beauties, just like the children. They also get pleasures from fantasies and dream of loving. Simply, they behaved childishly in their pre-loved period or pre-loved condition. We can find out by this word. There are childish winning, sucking, all these childish behavior. They are the babies of love rather than they had been a matured sort of love. So their earlier understanding had been gross one, filthy one, wrong one. So he questions, were we not win till then, but sucked on country pleasures childishly? Dan then tells about seven slippers or snorted we in the seven slippers den he alludes to the story of the seven christian youths of ephesus who slept in a cave for 187 years exactly to avoid the persecutions of decius the persian king to 
इंडिकेट दैट देयर सोल्स द लवर सोल्स वे आर इन डीप सामर थ्रू द एजेस बिफोर दे वे आर एवेकेंड बाय द अंडरस्टैंडिंग सो द स्टूपोर लाइक स्टेट हैड बीन द लवर्स अर्लीस्ट वेन दे कूड नॉट हैव द ट्रू अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ लव एज प्रेजेंटली दे आर हैविंग और प्रेजेंटली दे हैव कॉट द मीनिंग Hence, the inquisitive lover answers his own questions and says, "It was so, but these all pleasures fancies be. If ever any beauty I did see, which I desired, got, it was but a dream of thee." The lover says that the beautiful woman that he saw. desert and god in the past is only the image of reality in the line 5 all pleasures fancies be means compared to these that is present understanding of love any other pleasure is just a momentary whim you know he now finds expression in his beloved his beloved is the archetypal beauty of which other women are shadowy reflections this is the platonic conceptions of beauty and love again just after one line in line 7 8 you can uh, read this if i ever saw a beautiful woman and desired her and own her own her love i was just dreaming in advance of you so that the inversion can be read so the lines are very clear that whatever i had the desires it was but you and truly you the second stanza the inquisitive lover further explains his state of affairs and says now good morrow to our waking soul which watch not one another out of fear for love all love of other sides controls and makes one little room and everywhere the spirits of the lover and his lady are fully awakened to the strange and true passion of love and they are awakened souls greet each other earlier they had physical pleasure and being physical uh, physically attracted they had the fear of losing the mark of it they are now ruled by the mutual love a true understanding a true understanding a spiritual union they find so grossly earthly pleasurable physical entity they are now beyond it now they are resolved to one that oneness that oneness controls everything that being in love makes you careless about anything else you might see and in in line 10 or so it says love all love of other side controls so what it simply means it simply means love controls all love of other sides it means being in love makes you careless about anything else you might see you might uh, perform you might take action it is every sort of your actions is being controlled of you the status of being a lover or a beloved so being in love is the supremacy of the love the emotion that controls your other emotions that is very simple in fact the lover and the beloved's intense truthful love has made their little room in which they live and that living room has become the universe of theirs the lover here wants to signify that each of them had a different world and each of them had different entity and that entity serves them for their own individual world but as they are in truly in love the otherness of the world or the barriers of the worlds of this individual sort is broken in the supreme world of love they are in the single world living of love or the entity 
they are spiritually united now the walls of the individuality is broken now that oneness has become of the love so the lover and the beloved is now representing one world entity of individuality is broken into oneness of love so it says makes one little room and everywhere it's another poem from songs and sonnets the anniversary which projects the same traditional love it says all other things to their destruction draw only our love hath no decay this not tomorrow hath nor yesterday running it never runs from us away but truly keeps his first last and everlasting day so these lines are very parallel to that of the good morrow the lover in the good morning thus bids the new world of love which is unique oneself as well as for themselves now the line continued let see discoverers to new worlds had gone let's map to other and worlds on worlds have shown let us possess one world each hath one and is one a lot of references from navigations as well as sea explorers in fact that time of elizabethan period is the age of exploration and discovering new lands and john dunn's this particular good morrow and the references of navigations and sea voyages is all reminding uh, us that period where human soul is aspiring after unknown unseen beyond the horizon so the platonic love of true love you know yield oneness a perfect sphere you know uh, just look at the line what about explorer who have gone to new worlds or others who have been shown all earth and the heavens on terrestrial or astral maps so these were the questions why the new discoveries why the new maps why the world after worlds what's the utility of these to the lovers the speaker gives the answer let them have gone and have looks do what the navigations what the navigators what the pilots do let them do their jobs i don't need i don't need them i don't need extra world i don't need extra land i don't need an extra route my entire universe is right in front of me my beloved so this is exaggeration but that's true the lover thinks the whole universe rests upon his beloved and that is the unity and that is the ultimate goal of him the inquisitive lover here wants to explain the intensity of spiritual love of his and his lady for each other with the help of the imagery of a mirror their faces are here as mirrors that reflect their hearts full of true devoted love and therefore their faces are now in the index of their hearts where one can read the other so the line says my face in thine eye thine in mine appears and true plain hearts do in the faces rest the inquisitive lover compares himself and his beloved with the geographical hemisphere where can we find to better hemispheres without sharp north without declining west in the earthly hemisphere the north region is cold and icy and whereas the south is warm and pleasant but the unified world of love of the lovers knows no cold no warmth so the two lovers are surely to better hemispheres forming one unified world of love than the actual geographical world itself the scholastic theories of the nature of pure substance lack of homogeneity in the composition of a thing proves destructive but identical elements can be clearly fused so the poet says whatever dies was not mixed equally 
if our two loves be one and thou and I love so alike that none do slacken, none can die. The poet's assertion is that he and his lady love having identical hearts full of love for each other are completely fused into a unified identity and their love is immortal. The exaggerative lover opines here that only those elements which are not fully fused are subjected to degeneration, punishment, but their intense truthful love loving to each other is such fused that uh, they are like that of a unified whole. They have achieved a perpetual union even in this mortal world. Through this concept, the inquisitive lover here through, through the alchemy or metal science, through the alchemy or metal science, the poet here brings out a beautiful concept and he says uh, or the lover here argues that according to the medieval theory of alchemy, you know, a metal in which the components are not proportionately mixed is liable to decay and destruction. The lover here opines that their intense sincere love is like that of a perfect alchemy, you know, perfect amalgamation of selves. Their souls are vigil, their souls are immortal by the process of true amalgamation. So the lover and the beloved is on the way of uniformity in the way of perpetualness in the way of immortality and root through amalgamation. Whatever dies, it says, whatever dies was not mixed equally. If our two loves be one or thou and I love so alike that none do slacken, none can die. So it says, our love is immortal. We are undying as we are truly amalgamated. Seven line stanzaic poem, first four lines inquisitive lover questioning and next three lines in each of the stanza explaining those lines is a very beautiful poem. The Good Morrow is a typical love poem by John Donne. Here is the traditional declaration of triumph of love than any earthly objects. So many of them have been written and we have heard many of the sonnets of the same theme. Here is our old wine in a new bottle of concerts. What's your view regarding this? Let me know. I think uh, you have got the meaning of this poem clearly. If there is any doubt, just ask me. I will try my best to give proper explanation to the lines of the poem. Like, share, comment and subscribe to my channel. Thank you. Bye-bye.